Hi, Elvin. Um, thank you so much for joining the session today. Um, and for everyone who has just dialed in to watch this video, um, welcome to this part of the white paper. Uh, my name is Roxanne Boys, and I am the Sustainable Business Director at Dansu Sub-Saharan Africa. And on the call, we have a very special guest, um, not only because he's a friend of mine from Nairobi, but because he is the lead strategist and marketing director for Opibus, which you'll hear about in just a second. Um, but basically, this group um, and this organization is a startup that are obviously setting the standard for electrified motor vehicles in Africa, which is a very, very interesting space to be in right now. And in addition to that, Elvin is actually sitting um, at Amsterdam Airport on his way to COP26. And he is also part of one of the first ever youth discussions um, with the UN, and he's about to be flown into the pre-COP uh, conferences at the moment, um, to really add a voice to the youth and our opinions, and our ways of seeing the world, which is a, a very, very big step um, for the COP26 conference. So welcome, Alban, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. It's very exciting to be here. Um, yeah. Just uh, you'll have to excuse any background noise because it is an airport, but I think this should be a really nice conversation. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to it. We know that you're super busy and you have a lot on your plate, but we just have a few very quick questions to ask um, and I'll jump straight into it. So obviously, as I mentioned, Opibus is setting the standard for electrified motor vehicles in Africa. So you are within the space. And for those of us that are quite new to the whole climate discussion and, and the whole climate space, um, there are six main industries that can, that can create the, the biggest amount of change needed as quickly as possible. Um, and they are range from being energy to finance. And, and one of those industries, one of those top six, is mobility. Um, and we're, we're all very aware of this. Um, even when you know, COVID-19 hit us and, and people stopped driving as much, we saw how the smog levels in Africa reduced. From Nairobi, we can see Mount Kenya, we can see Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, and so mobility is a very important industry um, for the climate conscious future. So I just wanted to ask you a bit about why is mobility so important um, for being climate conscious in the future? Why is it such an important sector that needs to shift? Um, so, I mean, mobility is, is quite a, a large range of em emissions. It's both uh, global emissions, right, um, that contribute to climate change at home, but it's also local emissions. So local emissions are partic particul particulars and things like that that come from diesel and petrol cars, and they actually uh, reduce cognitive capacity, and emissions actually do kill 4.8 million people yearly. So, I mean, it doesn't even come close um, to, I mean, if we think COVID is bad, for example, we should be focusing on emissions if we want to extend life uh, on Earth at, at a whole. So mobility becomes really, really important there, right? Because it's noise pollution, it's local emissions, and it's global emissions. So this is where we come in as, as a company that's based in Nairobi. We do not only uh, build and manufacture our products here in Kenya, but we also design and develop them here. And we think that's very important because generally speaking, the automotive industry has left the African continent uh, on its own and the vehicles haven't been tailored or built or designed for the context, right? Which means that, for example, Kenya has 96% uh, uh, secondhand used uh, imported vehicles, which means they don't uh, keep any emission standards that we have seen in Europe or even Asia or, or the US, for example, they're just given uh, the secondhand vehicles that that also don't have any regulation for them. That's why it's important to, to be part of this local context and actually build products that are clean and have uh, enabled the possibility to actually leapfrog local manufacturing of internal combustion engine vehicles. So that's, I think, our role to play. That is incredibly powerful, and I wasn't even aware of those figures in terms of how many people, um, you know, die from emission-related causes, and even the fact that it reduces cognitive capacity within people um, is really, really important, like really interesting. Um, and these are big numbers. I mean, th this is no joke. This is massive. And um, and I think that really leads into the next question in terms of, and you even touched on it in terms of how Africa is leapfrogging, but 
you know, you're obviously leading in the space. And what are the, the big key trends that you're seeing around the world or within Africa, within mobility to sort of move away from this and learn from this? Um, and and is Africa leapfrogging with these different trends or are we actually leading some of these trends? Because I know, for example, in Kenya, we're leading with geothermal power and we're leading with solar. And there are things that the African continent is really leading on um, when it comes to climate conscious things and aspects. Um, how do you think those trends are forming from a mobility perspective and how is Africa faring within that change? Well, I, th I think the biggest part is that I can only take it out of a Kenyan context, right? Uh, we're based in Nairobi and we're expanding obviously over East Africa and West Africa currently. But uh, Kenya has 86% renewable energy production, which is crazy. But then we also have to remember the energy access is quite low. So what we at OPBUS believe can happen is that we get past this centralized grid that's very costly infrastructure wise to build out for charging and, and energy access as Kenya grows their economy, right? So we think it's important to rethink the technology for a local context and that can actually lower the initial cost of implementing renewable energy. And that's where we think electric mobility really comes in to accelerate the uptake of um, uh, renewable energy as you have a, a storage system in in the transport system right because a, a electric vehicle is also a storage of solar power during the night so you can use it as storage for your household as well as a means of transport so that becomes interesting with many aspects of how you can accelerate renewable uptake and I think that's a lot where we have to learn from 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 the rest of the world, from this context of implementing electric mobility. It also it, it's interesting that maybe electric mobility will make more sense in Africa since there is such a, 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 a easy production of renewables. Um, we think it may make more sense here than anywhere else. Also, I mean, if you have swappable batteries, you the the ability to adapt to these technology changes are much more rapid in this context. Also, Kenya is is the automotive uptake rate is also increasing very, very quickly, which means that we can maybe skip many phases of automotive production and get right into the most modern tech. Just like, I, I mean, in Kenya, I, I, I haven't been to a country that has better 4G coverage than Kenya. So, I mean, this is where we think we'll be going with, with the rest of the African continent as well. Right, and just a question, actually, that's just come to my mind, is that what you're saying sounds very exciting. And there's a lot of questions that people have in terms of how would you charge a Matatu? And for those that don't know, a Matatu is a big uh, public transport bus-like vehicle. Um, but you just said that you have replacement batteries, and so there are ways around that. Um, and we also know that there are certain companies like Total that's rebranded to Total Energies, that's looking at bringing renewable massively into their offerings. And so I think the, the big thing is that the question I have is in terms of infrastructure, uh, do you think that's something that's going to ramp up quite quickly? Because that's basically the missing piece of the puzzle, one of the missing puzzles in my mind, and I could be wrong, but do you think that that is something we're going to see increase rapidly? We really see that there's some electric charging stations at Village Market, which is a shopping center, for example, in Amarillo. Do you think that there's going to be a trend where that's going to become almost like a well, I mean, we're, we're looking at becoming the, actually the first implementers of public chargers on public land here in Kenya. So that's very exciting, uh, first of all. But I, I think the logic behind OPBUS's implementation is a little bit different than startups uh, that are in the electric mobility space, right? We focus on public transport, utility vehicles, and uh, electric motorcycle. And why is that? Because utility vehicles, they go from A to A, so they center around one point of charging which means you don't need a big infrastructure system. Public transport centers around two points, A to B, B to A, which means you can trickle charge at each end. And that means that we can create uh, vehicles that make more sense and have a faster return on investment because you can lower the, the amount of battery capacity in the vehicle, which is stands for 60% of the cost of an electric vehicle normally. So instead of working with the battery size and making that bigger, 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 you work with charging instead. and so by focusing on these areas, uh, utility vehicles, public transport, we can build out this infrastructure system while it doesn't exist, right? Um, because we tailor the solutions for the customer. 
And then the electric motorcycles are just any AC outlet that you have at home, which makes it really easy. Or even you could charge it with solar. So that's the exciting part about these vehicles. It's really you no know, high utilization where electric mobility makes a lot of sense and the vehicles are used immensely, lowering maintenance, fuel, and all these costs to, um, you know, lowering them with more than 60%. So I, that's why it potentially makes a lot of sense here because, for example, a Boda Boda driver, which is a taxi motorcycle or a transport motorcycle, if you can say that you can lower 60% 60, 60 of their running costs, it means they can ride less, make more, and, and it just changes you know, it's not just on a sustainability point of view, but also on the social impact side, which is really the, the focus of our business, maximizing the impact on all these areas. I see. And so, I mean, by what you're saying and what we're seeing also globally, looking at companies like General Motors, for example, is that this shift is inevitable and it's going to happen. And it's really exciting to see that this is not just a shift that we're going to watch from afar from the African continent, like other things, for example, but we're going to start seeing the shift here on the continent. It's coming and it may have a much bigger impact than some would expect because Africa is actually a phenomenal candidate for this technology that's that's coming about. And that brings me to my next question is, um, you know, in certain in certain uh, markets or or parts of the world, we are seeing that there are laws and policies that are helping this along. Um, in countries like Kenya, and I'll use as a reference point because you're there, are we seeing that the government is putting in certain subsidies? Um, like, is there support from, from that sort of level to push this forward, or is this still something that needs a bit of work from, from that sort of level of government? I mean, we are seeing policies um, that are actually emerging, I mean, with charging infrastructure and things like that. But I think, you know, the strongest thing that will shift the transport sector to electric is really what we're seeing now. Just a week ago, uh, fuel prices were raised with 10%. Same thing happened in February. That's twice a year. Fuel prices have been raised with 10%. And I don't think you have to be an environmentalist. I don't think you have to care very much about your local environment. I think the price will will completely regulate um, uh, the shift to electric mobility. And also, I mean, seeing spare parts, um, all these emission standards in Europe, and then we'll see, uh, you know, I mean, th this is the thing, right? Negative externalities have to be expensive. And I think from there, it's, it's a lot easier to be working with these new technologies. It also opens up for a, a wider, um, band of solutions than subsidies do, right? Because subsidies say there's one solution, this is the right one, we premiere that, while, you know, taxing negative externalities is much easier to, to find the, the right solution of many. Right. So, so we're seeing some, yeah. It's basically the economic levers that are doing, that are working in a way that's actually very beneficial. And so basically, conscious business is going to be competitive business uh, whether you're an entrepreneur and um, whether you're a bigger organization it's going to just make sense for you as an individual or a group to be going this way um, and that's really really good to hear because often when it comes to being more sustainable uh, the trade-offs are very far in the future and so this is something that just brings it closer to home and it's it's much more tangible it's almost immediate um, and you can start seeing those benefits and so that's really exciting to see um, and in terms of you know, this was a question I was going to ask, but I think you've addressed it so well, is, you know, is electric good for people, profit and planet? And I think, you know, just based on what we said now, it, it's so clear that this is the future. And yeah. so many businesses are going to have to adapt quickly because you're in the market, you know, you're doing these things on the ground. You know, every month, I'm sure that you guys are making massive advancements and it's going to happen very quickly. And so that brings me to my closing question in terms of, you know, there was a famous or well, two famous photographs that were taken in New York. And one, I'm not too sure familiar with this photograph. You're familiar. So for those of you that are listening, within the space of a decade, there was a photograph taken of a New York street where it was all horse carriages and one car. And about a decade later, the picture was taken in the exact same place on the same street in New York, and it was, you know, the the road was full of, of vehicles with one horse carriage. And so the shift was so quick and so dramatic, um, and it was such a game changer. 
And with mobility be, being one of these key industries that can make a massive difference, um, the numbers are there. Um, Alban just, you know, hit us off with that at the beginning. Um, Alban, for you, if we had to look at the next decade, and obviously, you know, you're thinking about this a lot, you're going, you're about to fly out to COP26 to give your perspectives and give your thoughts about the future and what we need to be doing. Um, what do you envision in the next 10 years leading up to the UN goal of the 2030 mandate? You know, what is your vision for, what do you think will happen to mobility in Africa in the next 10 years if you just had to use your imagination based on what you know today? Um, and it's not a prediction, it's just what would your vision be for the next 10 years? And, and should we be excited and should we be uh, preparing for massive change across the continent? I think for Africa, you will see an immense implementation of renewables to the point where we will have abundance of electricity in the next 20 years, um, which will also mean we will have electrified transport that will cost people basically nothing and the planet like so. And I really think that, you know, the future of mobility is shared and electric. And that means potentially in the US, Europe, autonomous. Here it means public transport, and I think it has to mean public transport all over the globe, right? So shared and electric and um, basically like the internet is today. It is at an abundant level where everybody almost has access to it. More people have access to a mobile smartphone than they have running water. And I think that's how we will see transport in the future. And that's a very near future. Thank you so much, Alban. I'm feeling very inspired and very excited about what you've just said. And for anyone else who has just listened to this interview and is feeling the same way, please, I encourage you to go and look at Opibus online. Um, they are working across a number of different um, vehicle types. And as Alban mentioned, there's plans in terms of electrifying uh, Kenya. And I'm very excited to be there, hopefully, and start seeing that myself. And I'm really excited to check in with you, hopefully um, not too far from now and start to see all of these things really living in the world and, and see how that's going. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And it's very clear that there are big changes and shifts coming for the continent. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. So yeah, just uh, follow us on any social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at, at OPIBUS, O-P-I-B-U-S. Thank you so much, Roxy. It's been a pleasure.